This presentation looks at communicating behaviorally. Let's break that down. Communicating, we mean vocal communication, written communication, and nonverbal communication. Some examples of this include the notes that we send home to our families, conversations we have in passing with our supervisors, with students, with related services professionals, and then when it's time to raise concerns to our supervisors. When we think about behaviorally, we mean that we're communicating about behavior. Remember, behavior is anything that an organism does. It can be observed and it can be measured. When we communicate about behavior, we want to use the ABCs. We need to describe the environment and the behavior in observable, measurable terms. What happened before and what happens after. Some examples of behaviors are that a student jumped, ran, screamed, hit. Each of those instances can be observed and it can be measured. Some non-examples of behavior would include got upset, was frustrated, mad. Those things can not necessarily be observed. Getting upset looks different for me than it does for you. And it also can't be measured. How do you measure getting upset? How many times someone got upset? How long did the upset last? Those are difficult things to define. We have lots of communication partners that we need to have these conversations with and do so in a manner um, that is behavioral. Some of these might include students. We talk to students every day. Staff members, our coworkers here at work. Our supervisors, behavior analysts, instructional leaders. Visitors, so people like interns or volunteers at the school and related service providers. Speech therapists, occupational therapists, physical therapists. Our students' parents. And then of course the general public, or how we represent or communicate about our job and what we do to the general public. Let's explore a little bit each of those communication partners. When we're communicating with students, some important things to remember are to be positive. 90% of this time, students are engaging appropriately and we want to make sure that we're being positive, being upbeat, happy, and encouraging to them. The other 10% of the time, maybe when our students are not engaging appropriately, we need to be neutral. This means lacking tone and limiting our body language. This does not mean being negative or um, yelling, things like that. Just being neutral, simply speaking in a neutral tone with neutral body language. And then we also need to make sure that we're following behavior plans when we're communicating with students. Some student plans will be specific enough to tell us what to say or what not to say to students. We need to make sure that we're um, following those behavior plans appropriately in those instances. When we communicate with staff members, we need to remember that if we need to talk about student behavior, we need to do so when we're not in front of students. For example, if we need to relay to a staff member that a student is engaging in a particularly dangerous behavior, it would be appropriate to step outside of the classroom and say that to the staff member at that time. We need to make sure that we're accepting to the point communication when we're here at work. This is a really fast-paced environment, and sometimes things are said very quickly um, just to kind of get a point across so that we can move on, we can all remain safe and interacting appropriately with our students. Um, and so sometimes that can come across as being kind of curt or short. Uh, make sure that you're assuming the best in your coworkers. Don't assume that because someone said something in a short or curt manner that they dislike you or that they don't like working with you. Um, it's definitely something that you can talk more about later, but sometimes that communication is necessary in the moment. We need to make sure that we're saving lengthier conversations for team meetings or for after school. So if you have something you want to talk to about a coworker, maybe um, you want to address the way that they're working with a student that seems to really be working and you want some pointers from them, those are conversations that should happen after school or during team meetings. We also need to remember to be collaborative. Um, each of you brings great things to the table and every decision that we make is made by the whole team. And so we want to make sure that we're collaborating and all bringing our ideas to the table, but then also understanding that um, maybe just because some idea that we've submitted um, is not what we're going to go with this time, that doesn't necessarily mean that it wasn't valued by the team. So we're all here to collaborate together. When we communicate with our supervisors, there's some things we need to remember. We need to remember to hold big conversations for the end of the day or team meetings. Similar to with your coworkers, there's going to arise times when you want to talk to your supervisors about um, how you could better improve what you're doing or perhaps asking about a strategy or suggesting something that you've seen work in the past. Make sure that you hold these things until the end of the day or until the team meeting, ideally. Um, likely, your idea or your thought is really valuable, and so we want to make sure that the whole team gets to hear it together instead of creating side conversations. You want to make sure to bring the details with you. Be prepared to talk about student behavior using antecedents behavior consequences, that three-term contingency. 
Be descriptive and behavioral. Your behavior analyst or your instructional leader will likely ask you a lot of questions. Well, when did you see the behavior? What did you do after you saw it? What was happening right when you saw it? Um, what were other students doing? How was the noise level in the room? And so you want to make sure that you're thinking about those details when you bring the concern to them. You need to make sure that you're being understanding of priorities and social significance. Um, it's not possible to target every single behavior for a decrease all at once. Um, so we want to make sure that you're understanding um, that sometimes your behavior analyst might say, I understand that that's going on with that student. Thank you for bringing it to my attention, but we're not going to address it right now. We've got bigger fish to fry, if you will. Um, so it's kind of up to them to be able to prioritize the things that need addressing in the moment and then other things that might be able to wait or might just um, be okay to kind of maintain until we have a little bit more time to spend on, on those things. And also make sure that you're open to trying new things. Remember that you and your supervisor and everyone on your team want what's best for the student. Um, your supervisor brings a lot of experience and expertise to the case, so make sure that you're open to trying their suggestions regardless of your opinion. It's totally possible that you think that something might not work. Um, and the benefit of what we do is that we're going to collect data the whole time, so we'll know if something's working or not working. Um, and so just kind of being open to, hey, you know, this is a different suggestion. It's not something I've tried before, um, but I understand that we're all in this together. We're all on the same team, and so if they're suggesting it, they think it will genuinely work. Um, and we can go ahead and implement it and take some data and then look back over our data and, and make some decisions then. When we're communicating with visitors and related service providers, um, some major pointers to remember is that we communicate with these folks on a need-to-know basis only. So we're only going to discuss the student or case or concern at present um, and not maybe other things in the environment, other students in the environment. For example, the speech-language pathologist requires only information about speech related to a student. So it is not appropriate to share with the speech language pathologist that the student that they're seeing could also use OT or um, is having some behavioral concerns at home, things like that. They, we need to talk to the speech language pathologist about how speech um, concerns impact this particular student. We also need to remember to maintain confidentiality of other students and staff members. Um, so if Johnny is here as a speech language pathologist to work with Susie, um, we need to go ahead and make sure that we're not sharing with Johnny that um, Kimmy might also be able to use some speech services. Um, that is really something that we just discussed with Kimmy's case manager and, and her family. So we want to make sure that we're not sharing about other students or staff. And whenever you're in doubt, make sure that you refer up. Um, there's going to come times where people will ask you questions that you're not sure if you can answer because of confidentiality. And it's 100% okay to always say, you know, hey, I'm, I'm not sure if I can have this conversation with you. I'm going to go grab my instructional leader or my behavior analyst, and, um, and I can bring them in on this conversation so that they can better help you out. Um, it's definitely better to refer a conversation elsewhere instead of kind of getting into these confidentiality traps. When we're communicating with parents, um, which we do to varying degrees throughout the day, Remember that parents are an extremely invested party. Um, these folks, even more than you, believe it or not, want to see their, these students succeed. They want to see their children do well and grow up to be happy, independent adults. Um, so make sure that you're not blowing off any parent concerns. More than likely, you've worked with a student with autism that is exhibiting whatever behavior is of concern to the parent. And so for you, it might seem like, yeah, we see this all the time. It's no sweat. Um, but to the parent, this might be the only time that they see it. It might really feel like a big deal. And so we want to make sure that we're not blowing off their concerns. We're being really empathetic. We need to speak behaviorally and consistently when we talk to parents. Um, so make sure that you're comments in person match the tone of the written communication. For example, if a student engaged in four episodes of self-injurious behavior during the school day and that's in their written communication, we want to make sure that when we talk to the parent, when we bring the student out to the car, we don't say, yeah, I had a great day. We'll see you guys tomorrow. Um, that can be really confusing to parents to see that he engaged in a lot of self-injurious behavior, but someone told me he had a great day. And, um, and so it really kind of presents like, you know, like that there's, a, there's an issue there. There's a concern there. We want to make sure that we're being optimistic, empathetic, and hopeful. Um, we are all on the same team. We all want all of our students, and we want the children of these parents to do really, really well at school. So reminding them that, hey, we're all on the same team. We all want the same things. We want to be optimistic about where the students are going to be able to achieve it in the course of a year or in the course of their time here with us um, or in the course of their life. We want to be empathetic to the concerns that the parents have, too. So um, everything, if it is a concern to a parent, is a big deal, and we want to treat it as such. We also want to be hopeful. Of course, it's our hope that all of our students grow up to be um, happy, independent adults. And so whatever phase we are in working toward that, we want to be hopeful that that's an end goal for everyone. 
We need to make sure to be specific with parents. So if we're going to share an activity or something that their child did at school, be as specific as you possibly can without breaking confidentiality. So, you know, instead of telling parents, oh, yeah, he played lots of games today, loved them, uh, maybe we could go in and say, hey, we played Boggle today, and he was able to match up to four-letter words, and he really seemed to enjoy it. He was smiling while we were playing. Um, so being really specific about the activities and the student performance and their behavior during the activity. Um, this allows parents to redo the activity at home if that's they so choose to or just to be able to talk to their child or to know what their child was engaging um, in while they were at school for so many hours. We need to be really really careful with parents to maintain confidentiality. So if we're talking to parent A, we're talking about child A. We never talk to parent A about child B or child C. And we also need to be careful not to talk to parents too much about staff members. Um, so things like, hey, your child had a great time today playing with a friend on the playground. It's more than likely that the parent's going to ask who the friend was. Maybe they can have them over this weekend to play. Um, and then we need to make sure that we're not sharing that information. And again, when in doubt, refer up. If you feel like you're not quite sure if you can share one piece of information or another, go ahead and let the parent know that you're going to grab the instructional leader or the behavior analyst to finish the conversation with them. Um, this also is really important to remember if conversations seem like they're going to take a long time. Um, so it's okay in a car line to say to a parent, hey, this seems like a really big concern to you and I want to make sure that it's addressed fully. So I'm going to let your lead teacher know or your um, behavior analysts know and they will get with you to schedule a meeting and a time for you to come in where you can both be focused on this and can talk through some solutions um, and just making sure that we're holding those long conversations are being held with the instructional leaders or the behavior analysts and that they're being held in a place other than the car line. When communicating with the general public um, we also need to remember that really important piece, maintain confidentiality. Um, I always like to think of this as a grocery store test. We never want to describe a student so that someone could identify them in a grocery store if they saw them. Um, so this means not sharing their name, not sharing specific details about their appearance um, or their clothing, about how they interact, about their mannerisms. Um, if, you know, if you happen to be talking to somebody about what you're doing or your job, just be general enough about the students that you work with that that person would not be able to identify the student in a grocery store. Remember that you're representing Commonwealth and the Founder Center. Um, you're a direct representation of these organizations every time you talk to someone about what we do or how we do it. You want to be professional, speak behaviorally. Again, you're representing this organization, so you want to make sure that you're speaking in a manner that is appropriate for what you do and for the training you've received. You also want to make sure that you're being optimistic and positive. Um, some people come in with preconceived notions about autism, or maybe they don't really have any opinions about autism. They have no experience. And so you really have the opportunity in the moment to shape what that person thinks about people with autism. And so you want to make sure that you're being optimistic and positive. Um, you know, we can have really tough days at work sometimes, and, or we can get injured at work sometimes. And it's really important that we don't go back into our communities and say, like, oh, gosh, yeah, it was an awful day. I got pinched four times and had my hair pulled. And um, I mean, that really doesn't represent people with autism in a very positive light. Um, so make sure that when you're communicating about any of your students or um, your cases or the things that, that you're doing here at work, that you're maintaining all of these things in doing so. Um, so that closes up our presentation. Just some reminders that um, most, most, most importantly is the need to maintain confidentiality when talking with anyone. Um, and second, most importantly, is that you always have the operation. Uh, I'm sorry, you always have the opportunity to go ahead and refer up. Um, so if you're not sure, if you're not sure what to say, if you're not sure how to say something, if you're not sure it's a conversation you should be having, go ahead and refer up. Pull in your lead teacher, your instructional leader, pull in your behavior analyst. I mean, it's always okay to take a break for, from a conversation as long as you do so politely and just say that you'd like to bring someone else in on that conversation.